Well, just so thank you very much, everybody, for coming. And I know some people are still joining uh, to the webinar. My name is Julia Beatty. I'm the head of department of veterinary clinical sciences at uh, City University and the Jockey Club College of Veterinary Medicine. And my job this afternoon is to introduce two of the authors of a very important study on the nature of animal abuse in Hong Kong. Mahatma Gandhi said the greatness of a nation, its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. Um, I think we're going to see that our greatness and moral pro progress um, in some places could do with a little help. Um, the, this is the first study of its kind in Hong Kong. It aimed to identify the types of cruelty that animals in Hong Kong are most at risk from based on empirical data. And importantly, the authors are gonna uh, give us some suggestions for mechanisms that could increase accountability and, and improve animal welfare in the region. There is a chat box for you to type any questions that you have. And when we get to the end, we'll be going through those questions. And now it's my very great pleasure to introduce um, our speakers this afternoon. The first is Amanda Whitford. Amanda is an Associate Professor in the Department of Professional Legal Education in the Faculty of Law at the University of Hong Kong and the Barrister of the High Court of Hong Kong. Amanda Whitford specialises in criminal law, wildlife protection and animal welfare law and her research has led to significant changes in Hong Kong's animal protection legislation and policy. Her research con conducted together with our other speaker, Dr Fiona Woodhouse, on animal cruelty in 2010, in fact, led to stricter controls on animal breeding and a change in policy to the management of feral dogs in Hong Kong. Amanda Whitford's dedicated to the transfer of academic knowledge to positive law reform, and she and Dr Woodhouse both sit on uh, the Legal Working Party advising Hong Kong AFCD um, on, on animal management. Amanda Whitford provides regular training for enforcement and prosecuting authorities in Hong Kong, and her research on wildlife offending has been utilised in sentencing by the Hong Kong judiciary. Our second speaker is Dr Fiona Woodhouse. Uh, she is the Deputy Director of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals in Hong Kong, and her primary interest, in fact, her career is dedicated to promoting animal welfare. So without further ado, I will hand you over first to Amanda Whitford. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Professor Beatty. It's very good to, to have a vet school in Hong Kong and to have a center for animal welfare there too now. Um, uh, everybody, I'm delighted to be with you with my uh, collaborator, one of my collaborators, there are in fact two others, um, but two of us are here today with you to discuss our project. Um, which we released the report on uh, recently to the Policy Innovation and Coordination Office of the Hong Kong SAR government. So I will be sharing the screen with you now. Um, and these are the slides that we will be taking you through. Okay, so this project is um, something that we have been working on for 12 months. Um, it was funded by the Policy Innovation and Coordination Office, as I said, of the Hong Kong SAR government. Um, and the purpose of the study was to determine how animals have been illegally harmed in Hong Kong during the study period of 2013 to 2019. And in order to make that assessment, we used a database that had been collated at the Society for the Protection of Prevention of Cruelty to Animals um, by their inspectorate, in particular, Chief Inspector Young. That database recorded cruelty investigations that had been conducted by the police in Hong Kong, where the SPCA had been involved. And what we were looking for was for trends in offending. So who are the defendants that are committing these types of animal abuses? What kind of animals are being harmed? And how are they being harmed? So what is the context? What is the impact of the harm? And how are their cases being sentenced? Um, 
none of which uh, has been studied in Hong Kong uh, before. And this was a um, seven year study. So we are confident that it provides a good, reliable um, bases on which to make judgments about the types of harm that animals are at risk of in this particular jurisdiction. Now, the AFCD, the Agricultural Fisheries and Conservation Department, commenced a uh, consultation in 2019, which is focused on strengthening the protection of animals in Hong Kong. And one of the um, foundations of, of that consultation that was discussed was the idea of introducing a duty of care for animals under Hong Kong law. Now, duty of care was introduced um, into the legislation in the United Kingdom in 2006. And it has been a very solid foundation on which greater protection for animals in that jurisdiction has been achieved. And it was in fact the recommendation of some earlier work that Dr. Woodhouse and I did back in 2008 through to 2010, um, that a duty of care should be adopted in Hong Kong. So that is something that um, we were very pleased to see uh, come forward in the consultation and that uh, we um, would fully support both from our earlier research and from the research that we have just finished, which we'll be talking to you about today. So what's different about this new research is we're looking at risks to animals. The last time we were looking at what the legislation was and how it compared to legislation overseas. This is an entirely different study. This time we are looking at the risks to animals in order to help government be informed as to what needs to be addressed in the current review of CAP 169, the uh, Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Ordinance. Now, of course, there is widespread concern uh, in Hong Kong and around the world about animal welfare and animal cruelty. And that in and of itself is a basis for continually reassessing the legal controls on this form of behavior. But to most effectively combat animal cruelty, the government needs robust and reliable statistical data on which to build law and policy. So with this new study, we've sought to provide that. And we hope that by giving the public access to this data, we can better inform public debate about how the law should be addressed and reformed to deal with animal cruelty. So this study was a collaboration, as I said, between myself and the second speaker, Dr. Fiona Woodhouse of the SPCA and Welfare Research and Development Officer Xu Ping Ho and SPCA Investigation Officer of the Inspectorate, Marsha Chun. And Marsha will be doing a second talk on this review in Cantonese at this time next week. So what we did was we looked back into the database of the SPCA recorded suspected cruelty offences between January 2013 and December 2019. Now there were 335 cases recorded during that period. And we were able to categorize them into six major types of animal abuse that are recognized in international research and policing. And they are active maltreatment, which includes traumatic uh, and psychological injury, um, so traumatic physical and also psychological injury, passive neglect, which includes malnourishment and abandonment, commercial exploitation, by which we mean the animals were exploited for the purposes of commercial gain to the offenders, hoarding, which means keeping of more animals than you can adequately provide care to, poisoning, 
and trapping and use of cruel devices. Um, of the 118 cases of active maltreatment, 63 resulted in a prosecution. And by that, I mean the case went to court and was commenced, didn't necessarily result in a conviction, but it went to court. So 63 of the 118 active maltreatment cases resulted in prosecution, 55 did not. Of the 102 cases which involved passive neglect, 61 resulted in a prosecution, 41 didn't. Of the commercial cases, of which there were 23, 16 were prosecuted. And we can break those down, 50% related to breeding of animals for the pet trade, two related to grooming, uh, deliberate infliction of harm on animals by groomers, two related to the hawking of puppies in the street, one related to a fish in an aquarium uh, where it was thrown to the ground by the aquarium owner in order to demonstrate the toughness of the bag in which it was being contained. One related to boarding in a establishment that was not licensed. One related to a dog trainer who uh, hit the dog that he was training with a plastic pipe repeatedly and one related to illegal surgery on a corgi's ear by the owner of a grooming parlor with the consent of the dog's keeper. 12 cases um, of hoarding resulted in 10 prosecutions. So this was the highest rate of prosecution amongst all of the cases. Uh, 59 suspected animal poisonings resulted in only two prosecutions over the period, and 21 trapping cases resulted in only four prosecutions in total. So you can see that there is a very um, significant difference between the prosecution rate depending on the typology of harm. So looking now at the defendant profile by typology, as you can see, most of the defendants acted alone. Very few um, were charged with a co-defendant. The overwhelming majority were male, um, with the exception of hoarding. Now, this could, of course, be the result of what we call gatekeeping decisions, meaning that uh, police choose to charge men over women for this type of offending we don't know that's a matter for further research but this is what the data is telling us and it suggests perhaps a need for particular focus on men in educational um, messages about combating animal cruelty now the age range was very wide um, we did however uh, see a number of young people abandoning their dogs and sometimes cats in village houses um, and avoiding prosecution by then evading uh, police um, notice for the six month period until the time had lapsed for their cases um, to be the subject of a prosecution. Then we come to animal um, species by case typology. As you can see, dogs were the major victim in all categories of abuse. Uh, we also noted that most of the cases involved mongrel dogs, not pedigree dogs, with these being collected and abandoned uh, in Hong Kong in very, very large numbers. Cats also, cats also suffered from some horrible active maltreatment uh, being tied up, being tortured in a couple of cases, um, left behind uh, to starve, uh, often with other species um, in abandonment cases. Although these animals were probably more adept at being able to escape than dogs or rodents or other species that we saw being abandoned. Uh, turtles and terrapins, hamsters, rats, rabbits, were all targeted for abuse and neglected. Um, in the category of wild animals, 
there were five cases of abuse involving pigeons. Um, they were generally uh, hit with sticks or shot with catapults. Um, and there was one case of cruelty that involved a wild pig. Um, breeding uh, pet shops were found to be keeping animals in poor conditions, uh, withholding vet care um, to save money, uh, and using drugs illegally to self-treat the animals in their possession. A very large number of um, cases in all categories of neglect would have benefited from the introduction of the duty of care. And that is, of course, a duty to provide animals that you have control of with minimum standards of welfare. High risk situations of neglect um, were uh, large numbers of animals being kept by young owners, often living in rental properties. And in nearly all cases, that meant village houses. Um, other high risk situations were dogs being tied in public places uh, where they could be attacked or roaming villages um, where they were the basis of complaints by neighbours for barking or were at higher risk for uh, poisoning and other problems. In four cases um, where uh, neighbours had attacked dogs in their village, they had urged the owners of those dogs to manage their dogs more effectively before the attack took place. Um, we were disappointed uh, to find that um, sentences have increased only very slightly since our last review in 2008 to 2010. Um, where we looked at sentencing data um, for imprisonment and other kinds of sentences as well. At that time, only half of the offenders were imprisoned and the average term of imprisonment was two months for the most serious cases of abuse. In this new study, we found that less than half of offenders between 2013 and 2019 of those convicted were imprisoned. And the average sentence where the defendant was charged with serious cruelty remains around the two month imprisonment level. Fines have increased um, from an average uh, 10 years ago in our last review of $1,200. Um, now the average is $2,900. So that has changed. Um, you can see from this table the breakdown of sentencing, and it shows you the percentage of offenders who received each kind of sentence, which is down the left hand side. Um, so you can see, for example, in the active maltreatment typology, that 43% uh, of offenders received a sentence of imprisonment, um, whereas for neglect, 26%. Um, so those convicted of active maltreatment were much more likely to be imprisoned than those who were convicted of passive neglect. Um, now, in my view, unfortunately, this is because abandonment or other forms of neglect are not considered uh, as culpable as active maltreatment. It's not taken as seriously. Um, however, of course, the impact of both kinds of harm is very, very serious on the animals. In fact, uh, one third of animals that had been actively maltreated died or had to be euthanized within 24 hours as a result of their treatment and the same for neglect. So the ultimate impact on the animals um, from a deterrent perspective should not be different. Uh, so this is concerning that that is going on. Um, the same trend appears with the use of community service orders. Uh, these were often ordered against defendants convicted of neglect or hoarding, but much less often used for 
cases involving active maltreatment, by which I mean usually physical traumatic injury or commercial exploitation, which normally involved um, animals being sold for profit. Uh, in many cases, the defendants uh, argued to the courts that they loved animals uh, and the magistrates accepted that, that they had good hearts, they deserved leniency. Now, for the animals concerned, of course, there is no leniency. Um, and it would be helpful for the magistrates to realize that whatever good intentions defendants may start out with, at some time, it would become clear to any reasonable humane person that the animals in their care are suffering or that they are at serious risk of suffering if their circumstances do not change. And when they fail to take action to alleviate that problem, they should be punished appropriately and deterrently. Uh, the same trend can be seen um, in comparison between imprisonment for commercial exploitation and hoarding. Commercial cases were much more likely to result in imprisonment, even though both types of offending usually involved large numbers of animals. And the level of suffering, of course, in both types of offending is entirely comparable. Both kinds of cases involve animals being kept in harmful environments, deprived of basic care, often suffering from disease that is untreated and general neglect. Yet while the courts might be able to understand the culpability in the actions of those who are keeping animals for profit, um, they're much more likely to excuse those who are not keeping them for profit. Uh, particularly if they've collected them from strays. But it is extremely important that uh, those who sentence in these cases recognize that hoarded animals suffer every bit as much as those who are being kept for breeding. And the intention of the defendant is not relevant. The offense itself is one of um, objective mens rea. So to take into account what the defendant intended is not appropriate when in both types of cases, animals are suffering severely as a result of the choices of the defendant. We were also very disappointed to see the number of bindovers being used in very serious cases of cruelty. Particularly, um, we saw this in relation to wild pigeons in one case in which the bird had been attacked by the defendant, the prosecutor sought an O-N-E bindover, which is where the defendant um, receives a bindover and the prosecution do not offer evidence against him. And the magistrate, to her credit, was shocked. And she took it upon herself uh, at this idea that the defendant would receive an O-N-E bindover to explain to the defendant the seriousness of his behavior. Um, in cases involving species other than dogs, unfortunately, this was common. The sentences uh, were significantly lower. Uh, the longest sentence we have for a species outside of cat and dog was 4.5 months for a pencil stabbing case involving the death of 10 turtles. Um, and in a case where a rat had been burned alive by the defendant in a trap that the defendant had set, uh, he received a bind over, which means that uh, he was bound over to be of good behavior without any other kind of control on him. In fact, uh, his trap was even returned to him at the end of the case. Going to a breakdown on some of the typologies, uh, in relation to active maltreatment, uh, in most cases, the animal, whatever species it was, was harmed by people who knew the animal prior to the offence. Um, and in 38% of cases involving traumatic physical abuse, that defendant was the owner. 
of the animal. Uh, domestic violence against family members, pets, and neighborhood disputes, as I said earlier, about dogs causing nuisance by barking, roaming, uh, and other um, things that disturb other people made up the other 24% of cases in that this active maltreatment category. Now, a lot of this abuse was very serious. As I said, one third of cases caused the immediate death or need to euthanize of the animal involved. In the neglect related cases, um, offenders often told magistrates that their uh, offending was triggered by financial or relationship problems leading to the abandonment of their animals. Um, of course, it's important that there are strong educational messages about abandonment, that it is an act of extreme cruelty and that it is very likely to result in the death of the animals concerned. Uh, it's really important that there is community support to encourage owners who can no longer cope with the animals that they are keeping and can no longer provide them with appropriate care um, to understand that the best thing they can do is to surrender them. Half of the neglect cases that came from abandonment as the basis of neglect resulted in animals dying. And in a few cases, kind neighbors had kept those animals alive until the um, authorities uh, became aware that they were there by uh, feeding them through windows or through fences, but many of them starved to death before rescue came to them. Resources to streamline and encourage timely surrender of animals at risk, encouraging the reporting of situations where people suspect that animals are being left unattended, uh, and community awareness generally of the positive impact of surrender for animals over abandonment all need to be emphasized, understood, um, and taken forward in educational messages going, going, going um, into the future. Owners must understand that risking suffering through prolonged starvation is an act of terrible cruelty. Um, and timely surrender is an act of kindness. It gives an animal a chance. Abandonment gives it, on this data, clearly very little chance of survival. In the not preceded categories, cases were often not punished because the offender couldn't be located or identified within the six month time limit for the cases to be prosecuted. Three of those cases involved animals that had been shot with metal pellets from air pistols, uh, generally dogs. Um, given that people in Hong Kong are already not allowed to carry offensive weapons in public places, we have made a recommendation that air pistols be banned. Um, in other cases, uh, animals um, were not the result of prosecuted um, uh, trials because they didn't exhibit signs of abuse on investigation, despite eyewitnesses accounts of them being attacked. Uh, where an animal has been attacked, uh, and there is a good eyewitness account. However, we suggest that those cases should be being pursued. But it's important to recognize that under the law as it now stands, it is not necessary for an animal to suffer physical abuse for a cruelty prosecution to be taken forward. It is, it's, it is enough if the animal has suffered psychological abuse. So where there is a good eyewitness, and it's important that people do make statements when they see these things, and that they not just make those statements, they're prepared to go to court and give evidence about what they saw, then these types of cases should be pursued, even if the animal isn't showing overt signs of physical abuse. The abandonment cases that didn't go to trial, um, mainly the pervasive problem there was the failure to, to locate the defendant within the six month time limit. There were eight cases uh, of serious abandonment where that occurred. 
Uh, we've suggested a legal solution to deal with that problem with a summons being laid at court. Um, in future, if the law is amended and cases can be tried uh, on indictment, which means without a limit on the amount of time to prosecute, then that problem will fall away. But for the time being, we suggest that summons should be being issued anyway, as is possible with a summary offence. We were also disturbed to see that in a number of cases, animals had starved to death after their owners had been detained in custody by the courts. Um, and we have recommended that a protocol is put in place to ensure that defendants and patients are routinely asked by police, by judges, by hospital admissions staff, and by other custodial officers, whether they have animals at home that need to have care provided to them. Finally, where animals are at risk of neglect, the duty of care would be important to ensuring that those cases are carried forward. At the moment, there is far too much subjectivity in the hands of enforcement authorities to determine whether an animal is suffering or not, or whether it is at risk of suffering. The introduction of a duty of care would make it much easier for enforcement authorities to take swift action to address situations where animals' basic welfare needs are not being met. Um, as far as sentencing was concerned, uh, this table shows the highest and the lowest sentences of imprisonment, okay, so there's no CSOs or old probation orders or other things on this table um, for each of the years in the study. Uh, the highest penalty was 12 months imprisonment across the entire seven year length of the study, um, which was imposed in three cases. Uh, the first in 2015 involved a man who put a cat inside a carton, tied it up, um, and then uh, tortured it for some hours. His offence was caught on CCTV outside a shop. The second in 2017 involved a man who left 18 dogs and a cat inside a squatter's house without food and water for two weeks. Uh, 10 dogs died as a result. The third, which was also in 2017, involved a man who abandoned 12 dogs and five turtles inside a squatter's house after he lost his job and his girlfriend. Six of those dogs starved to death and uh, some of their bodies were to some extent consumed by those that were found alive on rescue. The next longest sentence was 10 months imprisonment in 2019 for a man who ran a shelter a rescue shelter uh, filled with sick and starving animals. 36 had died before the volunteers who worked there raised the alarm and rescue came. In 2013, a man was sentenced to seven months for strangling a stray cat and beating it to death. Initially, he received a three month sentence, but after a self review, um, the magistrate raised the penalty. Uh, there have been many cases where very different sentences have been given on similar facts. A uh, particularly um, pertinent example is prolonged dog beatings. There was a man who kicked a tethered dog in an alleyway who was imprisoned for 10 weeks in one case, and yet another who beat a dog for barking repeatedly with a plastic pipe who was sentenced to 160 hours in a community service. A dog trainer who did the same thing received only 120 hours community service after striking the animal he had been paid to train with a plastic pipe. A man who hit a neighbor's tethered dog over the head with a shovel received 80 hours community service. Um, Sentencing for commercial exploitation also is still low 
despite the clear message which the uh, legislation provided in 2016 that unlicensed breeding of dogs will no longer be tolerated within Hong Kong and should be taken seriously. In late 2017, a defendant who was keeping 100 dogs and puppies, pedigree animals, uh, in uh, filthy cages, uh, starving in some cases, some of them debarked, obviously, to avoid neighbors complaining, um, received only seven weeks imprisonment for cruelty and uh, for keeping dogs without a license. We're also um, concerned by the number of court decisions where magistrates returned animals to people who clearly could not care for them properly. In one case, a defendant was keeping six dogs in a filthy structure filled with rubbish and excrement with very little food and water. All the dogs were below acceptable weight. Some had skin diseases and he had another 60 dogs on wasteland uh, kept somewhere else. Yet the magistrate returned them even after they had been in uh, the homing section um, on detention for 12 months in that case on the basis that this person could care for them adequately. In another case, a dog was returned to the owner despite his earlier conviction for cruelty and failing to provide proper care to a dog. And that returned dog became a repeat victim when again it was abandoned in a flat with another dog. So it's clear that there needs to be better understanding in the courts of the risk in returning animals to people who are incapable through financial, through work commitment, through health relief, health reasons or other reasons of caring for their animals properly. And we'd like to see sentencing guidelines provided for animal cruelty cases to help the magistrates to be more consistent and to understand the things that need to be emphasized and considered. In 2019, the Court of Appeal was asked to consider a review against sentence for a case in which the defendant and another person had drowned a mongrel dog they were entrusted to wash in a drug rehabilitation center. The court declined to provide sentencing guidelines saying that the, sense, the cases are too different to allow for sentencing guidelines and consistency within Hong Kong. Now, our review has shown that there are clear patterns of offending and types of harm that could be the basis of guidelines going forward. The UK has them, Australia has them, uh, and we have provided examples of their guidelines within our review. Hopefully, this could be something that is taken forward in the near future. And then we come to the recommendations that we have made more generally for law reform. The first of these is the adoption of a duty of care. Now, that was the primary recommendation of this study and our previous study in 2010. Hong Kong needs to urgently introduce a duty of care for all animals in order to complement its cruelty protections under CAP 169. And we are very glad that the government is pursuing this reform and that a duty of care is likely to be added to the amended CAP 169 in the near future. This will solve all of the, not all of the problems, but many of the problems that we have identified in our review. It will mean that people will be held to stricter standards for the way that they treat their animals and it will provide an educational uh, impact as well as a deterrent for those who are flouting the legislation. The idea is that notices would be served on people who are failing to provide appropriate care to their animals, requiring them to meet minimum standards, which would enable them to understand what they need to do and hopefully solve those problems quickly. Prosecutions, of course, will still sometimes be necessary, 
but with notices being served, in many cases, the problem will be rectified quickly. Animals don't seek retribution. Animals seek swift and effective change to their situation. And this is what duty of care legislation can provide to them. It will make it also easier for enforcement authorities to seize animals where they are at risk of suffering if the circumstances in which they are being held are not changed. So this will actually make a very important difference to the way people are being treating their animals. It will allow for speedy, proactive intervention. It will be positive rather than um, negative in what it requires. It will be proactive rather than reactive. And it will require all animals in all contexts to be treated with the appropriate care that they all deserve. So I'm going to pass the slides over to my um, collaborator, Dr. Woodhouse now, for her to continue. Uh, thank you, Amanda, and hello to everybody. And I think Amanda will probably chip in at some point on, on the comments. Um, but first of all, um, looking at one of the recommendations um, that we were talking about as a result of this study and report, is looking at how we can um, introduce some measures and regulations to tackle the very, very serious issue of animal hoarding. Um, animal hoarding is a global issue, and it's a significant cause of very poor welfare for animals. Um, in our study, we saw a significant number of cases um, that involved the hoarding of animals, um, sometimes five or six animals or 10, but sometimes up to 100 or more. Um, and this is a very, very significant issue for the animals involved. Um, what we talked about to some extent is how could we possibly prevent hoarding? Um, and this, in certain some aspects, we looked at whether or not there might be some mechanism that we can introduce to track uh, numbers of animals and people who were owning large numbers of animals, um, looking at things like licensing, registration, maybe differential licensing fees so that we can actually keep a track of the situation and know where potential problems may occur, where people are actually amassing larger numbers of animals. Amanda has referred to the duty of care um, introduction, and this will also help um, these types of animals, but then we've got to be aware of where they are and know that they may be getting into trouble and see that there are issues there. Um, so what we're thinking about is really when we have these facilities or, or sort of um, areas with large numbers of animals, we should have some specific legislation um, along the lines of the legislation in the CAP 139, um, the uh, Public Health Animal Trade, Animal and Bird Traders Ordinance, um, to sort of try to safeguard these animals and have regular um, licensing and inspections so that we can actually observe the condition of the animals and intervene early if issues start to arise. So this is actually preventing the, the problem from occurring. Um, obviously in terms of this type of approach, you need to be able to know where the animals are and you need to have the legal right to access those, those areas as well. Um, we're also considering shelter legislation and this is actually a global trend in some areas. It's being considered in the UK, it's introduced in Australia, there's some in um, the Channel Islands, there's some in America as well. Um, and, but what we have to recognize is that animal shelters play a very, very vital role in supporting animal welfare and also in animal management. So this type of legislation is aiming to assist the animals that are in the shelters to safeguard their welfare and following along the same lines and principles that are linked to other legislation that regulates facilities where large numbers of animals may be held, such as farms, uh, riding schools, boarding establishments, uh, breeding uh, establishments, dog, and cat, uh, dog breeding establishments, and pet shops as well. So it's similar in that we would expect that there will be some sort of minimum standards, some go codes of practice, etc. But the key element there is that there is some regular monitoring. So to help these animals um, avoid getting into a situation where the consequences for them may be very serious and, and indeed life threatening as well. Okay, next slide. Um, so in this case, we're talking about other types of um, regulation. 
Um, as Amanda talked about earlier on, we had some instances where actually people who are operating animal related businesses were involved in animal abuse of various types. Um, quite often uh, physical violence, sometimes um, mutilations, um, et cetera. And so again, we're looking at the area of whether or not these people should also be regulated along the lines of potentially the pet shops and the pet shop employees where we have to have some form of training and some form of licensing system, some sort of safeguard to ensure that these people are aware of what they should do, that they have the right um, educational background, that they know the theories of the areas that they're involved in, and that they aren't involved in any egregious practices as well. Um, we did see some uh, issues with animal boarding, and of course we do have regulations already, but we need to look at how we can improve the regulation for animal boarding establishments or indeed the enforcement as well. Another area is um, unnecessary mutilations. This is to some extent covered already by the veterinary surgeons registration ordinance where veterinary surgeons are not allowed to perform certain procedures unless there's a medical um, indication. The issue with that, however, is that often uh, these mutilations are carried out not by veterinary surgeons um, and also the owners are involved in permitting or commission, commissioning the mutilations. And so the concept here is that basically, obviously if somebody is performing a mutilation, they can probably be prosecuted under the main ordinance CAP 169 for cruelty if they've inflicted pain without um, anesthetic or analgesias, et cetera. But equally, we want to be able to prove that that procedure was not done properly by a veterinary surgeon. And so therefore there would be a reverse burden of proof on the owner to actually prove that the procedure was carried out by a registered veterinary surgeon for a proper valid reason, medical reason as well. Um, and in some countries, they're even introducing uh, bans on uh, possession of mutilated animals. So it's not possible to have a dog with cropped ears or a dog tail or, or duples unless you have the requisite paperwork that proves that this was done for a medical reason. We're also considering the new offences about deterring animal poisoning. And this is a very, very difficult area of animal abuse to deal with because it is a remote crime. Um, very often the poison is laid and it is a while before the animal consumes the poison. And equally, you may also have to prove that the animal suffers as a result of poisoning. So here, the suggestion is that there should be a specific offence introduced that is just the administration of a poison to an animal. Um, obviously, there may be some exceptions for um, sort of pest control um, under different ordinances. Um, however, we will have that offence there. Equally, there is a suggestion that um, possession of a poison in a public place without a reasonable um, excuse or a varied reason would also be offence, which uh, follows along the lines of possessing a uh, offensive weapon in a public place as well. So again, um, it's without that uh, valid reason for having a, a poison in your possession uh, that you may be able to use um, in a negative way against animals as well. Um, improving the control of traps and, traps and cool devices. Um, in some jurisdictions, uh, electric shock collars have been banned and they are obviously uh, very cool devices and should be banned. And that is one of the recommendations of, of this report. But equally, we would like to see improved control over the use of traps. Um, in some uh, areas, such as New Zealand, the regulation of traps has actually been brought under the animal welfare um, ordinances. And this is to try to regulate um, what traps may be used. So some uh, traps may be banned outright. Some traps may be controlled um, and, and regulated as well. And the issue with this is that currently um, our trapping legislation is under CAT 170, which relates to wild animals. And therefore there is potential for the interpretation to allow the unregulated use and potential abuse of certain types of traps against companion animals or non-wild animals as well. Equally, um, glue traps are very, very problematic. Um, they are generally used for pest control uh, devices against rodents. However, they cause a tremendous amount of suffering to the animals. So um, in fact, our approach is that they shouldn't even be used for um, rodent control. However, you know, in some jurisdictions, they are allowed to be used by licensed pest control operators with very, very strict protocols. 
Um, but obviously, in terms of, of use in Hong Kong, we see a lot of non-target species being caught up in, in these blue traps, and they suffer just as much as the rodents do as well. Equally, we did see several cases where we had uh, uh, issues with people keeping their animals in situations where there was a risk to them um, from falling from heights, such as they were being kept on rooftops. And in one instance, um, uh, some dogs actually fell from the roof twice. Um, so we are, we are actually proposing that we should be, in addition to duty of care, a specific offence uh, relating to allowing an animal to fall from height in terms of a, a negligence type of approach. Another uh, sort of area of concern is obviously what happens to the animals, the victims of, of animal abuse, um, when they have been uh, sort of rescued from the situation. Currently, if the animal is owned and the owner is not the abuser, then the animal stays with the owner. And the owner can also apply to the court um, for, for costs related to having to pay for treatment in relation to any damage caused to that animal. However, if the owner is the abuser or the, um, the animal is unowned, then the animal may be detained um, during the court proceedings. And this can be quite negative for the animal because obviously it uh, is held in a situation in an animal shelter for, for sometimes from our study, many, many months to sometimes a year. And this ha has both a negative impact on the welfare of the animal potentially, but also it increased the costs associated with the care. So we are actually looking at how we could actually have a mechanism to assist with the early release of these animals. Um, and there are two mechanisms that we discussed. One is using existing powers um, under the ordinance 221. However, another recommendation is to specifically include something in the new amended legislation. Um, and there is precedent for that in other legislation where potentially a forfeiture order could be presented to the owner um, to sort of say, look, uh, we would like to um, release this animal and, and forfeit your ownership. And there's, and do you have potentially a two week period to appeal against it? So the people aren't forced to, to give up the animal, but it just triggers that um, sort of mechanism to get people to consider whether that's an option as well. We also have looked at the costs related to these cases, and some of these costs are very, very, very significant. And when animals are injured, a lot of the costs are up front um, at the very, very start of the case when maybe they need surgery, intensive medical care, uh, fracture repair, et cetera. However, under the current legislation, the costs are only recoverable after conviction. So what we're suggesting is that actually we should change the mechanism for considering um, when costs may be uh, sort of asked for in terms of partial compensation to be from the date of seizure so that we have that mechanism that we can truly look at whether we should add into the case handling uh, sort of restitution for the costs of rehabilitating and caring for the victims as well. Mercy release is a big issue. Amanda's talked about abandonment and we're very, very happy that animal abandonment will be included under CAT 169 as a specific offence, and we think that there should be detail looked at as to how that is going to be classified to ensure that there are no loopholes. But we're also very, very concerned about mercy release, which is a form of animal abandonment. And we believe that in parallel to introducing a specific legislation for animal abandonment under CAT 169, there should be additional um, legislation under um, other ordinances such as CAP 170 and even uh, some of the country parks and special area protection ordinances to prohibit the release of any animal into those areas and into the wild environment. Um, this could follow the model that's been introduced in Singapore in 2020, where um, release of, of wild animals or animals into the wild environment is strictly controlled by the authorities and can only be done in certain circumstances with certain animals that have been approved and with a permit. Um, and that could really, really help tackle some of these dreadful cases that we see. And the pictures on here are of a case a few years ago where a large number of terrapins um, were actually, which are freshwater turtles, were actually abandoned into salt water. Um, and the 
beach lifeguards, the LCSD staff were rushing around trying to rescue as many turtles as they, they found. And we um, eventually picked up over 200, but probably we uh, many, many more will have suffered and disappeared and, and suffered a slow and painful death. So these are some of the recommendations. Um, and Amanda might want to add to some of these areas. I'm not sure, Amanda. No, thank you, Fiona. I think you've covered um, all of the uh, important points that we wanted to make. So um, I think that leaves it to Professor Beatty now. Hey, well, thank you very much um, to both of you and in fact to all of your team um, for presenting so, um, so candidly and, and, and professionally such an important study, such important baseline data to improve um, the welfare of animals um, in, in the region. And I, I mean, I've been a veterinarian for over 30 years and I, I find it harder and harder to hear even the, the outline of the details of, of these cases. And I know many of our participants who are hopefully typing their questions in the chat right now, please do go ahead and type your questions. Um, we'll be rightly horrified at, at what they've seen, um, but such important information. I On that on that topic, it is, it, it's, you know, to see why, why people might prefer to, to turn a blind eye. And you've both highlighted how important it is for members of the community not involved in the abuse to come forward and to report that, um, to support the animals and the victims in these cases. Do you have uh, thoughts about ways that we can empower people to, to, to do that? Are there examples from other jurisdictions, for example? Is it an education issue? Um... Uh, I think I think definitely um, it's it's a, a, an issue that could be better supported. I mean, there are obviously uh, phone numbers that people can ring. Um, uh, one consideration might be when landlords are not receiving rent, if they're aware that there are animals at the property, that they take it upon themselves to to uh, check the property and if necessary to to call in the AFCD or the SPCA the police um, to, to 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 come uh, um, it, where people are aware that animals are being uh, ill treated I think there's a lot of um, um, in Hong Kong's a very built up place I mean none of us want to interfere with our neighbors we all live very closely to one another but I think I think we do need to recognize that where animals are involved, there is a short period of time before things can, will go very badly. Um, and that really it's not something that you can turn a blind eye to or, or even um, turn a half an eye to. It's something that, that might be quite urgent. So, so people do need to be more proactive uh, about, about looking after um, the animals in their community. And also um, I think related to this is, is what became very clear was some of these animals uh, that were aggressively attacked, um, were attacked um, in their villages by, by other people living there. And uh, of course, that animals should never be attacked under any circumstances. But, but we as owners of animals must be aware that other people don't necessarily like animals um, and that we need to be careful with the way that we interact um, with those other people and the way we allow our animals to interact with those other people. Um, I think that um, equally, it is very important for the public to stand up and speak out. Um, but just speaking out and reporting the incident sometimes isn't enough. People need to be prepared to be a witness, to make a statement, to go to court. And sometimes that's where we can fall down on the evidence because, you know, somebody has to say, I saw this on this day, or I took this video, or, I took this photo. In some cases, you know, uh, probably we haven't been able to progress because we've lost that first and uh, sort of prima facie evidence. In other cases um, that I'm aware of where we have had witnesses that have been reluctant to step forward, the police have actually been able to do other investigations to, to move the case forward. But it is very, very important that people are prepared to stand up because these are silent victims. And I think one of the other things Amanda and I have discussed is, you know, should there also in the new legislation be some element um, similar to, to what you would get in child abuse cases, where if there are multiple potential suspects that remaining silent 
you know, um, is not the defense that you can use to avoid being prosecuted. Um, because sometimes if there is a, a, an abuse case in the house um, and somebody reports a concern and then there's four people inside and everybody remains silent, it may be difficult to prove who should be prosecuted. So we should also look at those areas as well, because these are voiceless victims. They cannot say so-and-so did this to me, so-and-so did that to me. So that's very important for people to stand up and also to look at other sort of potential loopholes in the future. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, we do have some questions in the in the chat, which I'll, I'll, I'll go through now, and, and I encourage everybody to submit their questions to the chat. Um, the first one, um, could you elaborate on the sentences imposed in Hong Kong? That was specifically to Professor Whitford. Thank you. Okay, well, um, okay, can you hear me? I just, I think I just done you. Yes, good. yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, look, um, I, I, the sentences, I, I, I have covered them um, as much as we had time for today. I mean, I can say that as far as sentencing guidelines are concerned in other jurisdictions, um, uh, with very serious crimes, they, they start off um, with about a third to 50% to of, the, of the total sentence as the starting point. And we're not anywhere near that in Hong Kong. I mean, our starting point is much lower than that. Um, if we applied the same kinds of starting point for high culpability cases that we're seeing in uh, England and Wales and Northern Ireland, for example, then our starting point would be between nine and 12 months imprisonment. And as you can see from the, the data that we've collated, that at the moment is the outlier, that, that, that was only applied in three cases in the last seven years. So starting point, um, as the lawyers will know, means the, the basic tariff sentence that you have for a particular example of a particular crime. So if we had a starting point, um, of nine to 12 months in Hong Kong for animal cruelty based on our maximum penalty of three years, then that would be statistically even with the other jurisdictions that we compared sentences with. And yet we don't. We, we, are, we are using a very, very low starting point compared with the legislation that we have. And what's quite shocking is that the starting point hasn't changed since the legislation was amended um, up to three years imprisonment. So it appears that the sentencing um, thinking is still back where it was uh, before 2006. And that, that surely isn't right when we've had a legislative change. Thank you very much. Um, another question here. Do you have any um, initial um, studies, have there been any initial studies on the impact of the duty of care reform in the UK? Uh, yes, the duty of care um, reform in the United Kingdom has been very positive. Uh, it has meant that um, people have a much greater understanding of what's necessary, what they need to provide to different species of animals. Um, there are codes of practice uh, which have been developed to support the duty of care, to educate people as to what they need to do. Uh, and of course, they're general because, you know, what, what you do how much exercise you give a 14-year-old dog will be quite different to how much exercise you would give to a young puppy. Um, but, but there at least are guidelines as to, to what are the types of things that people need to do in order to ensure that their animals have a life worth living. That's the base standard, a life worth living. Um, that's what we should all be giving our animals. Uh, so yes, it, the studies show it's been positive. It's meant there have had to be far less prosecutions for people that are educational um, and where the people don't want to be bad, they just need some guidance. Uh, and it has meant um, that people are much uh, more likely to um, prosecute those cases where there really is a failure um, because there's not this overwhelming number of cases that need to be dealt with. You start to hone in on the few that really need to go to court and fix the rest with the improvement notice mechanism that I was describing earlier. Um, I think though, um, I think if you talk about some of the New Zealand experience, so whilst the improvement notices really work, you, you may have to look at 
whether there is a mechanism for um, some sort of sanction against recalcitrant uh, people, because I think what they found in, in New Zealand is when they'd introduced the duty of care and some of their notices, there was no sanction. So some people would just ignore it and it was the same people. So there's a, a small group of people who, who may resist improvement notice or, or taking action if there is no subsequent mechanism that can pick them up if they fail to comply or re repeat offenders or something happens over a period of time. So I think that's an area that we need to look at um, and have the flexibility well to either include at the outset is that somebody refuses um, almost like I would say without being flippant, but if you get a, a building notice and you don't comply with it, you're not prosecuted for cruelty, you're prosecuted for non-compliance with the order. Um, so, you know, whether or not you can encourage people, nudge people by having another mechanism that doesn't result in a criminal conviction, but nudges people in the right direction if they're just, you know, not, not playing ball and not following your guidance and, and that the animal's welfare and then their quality of life is not being improved. Um, so that's something we should look at, whether it comes in, or whether the legislation is drafted in a way that in the future that can be introduced if there is such a problem in Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Um, another question here on the impediments to reform in Hong Kong and your um, impressions of what they might be. Is, it, is this a tangible resistance or uh, just apathy? And uh, what's it, uh, effective in your experience in achieving the successes you have to date, given the glacial general speed of Hong Kong law reform? Um, well, obviously, you have to do your research. Um, you know, we everything that we have pushed for, we've had research to to base our our um, our ideas on and our recommendations on. Um, uh, animal welfare, I think, is something the public cares very much about. I think the government is aware that the public care very much about this. So that does uh, mean that it's something perhaps where we can gain some traction based on public interest. Um, where we haven't gained traction, uh, one of the things that, that um, we haven't been able to achieve despite trying very hard is to get the housing department to change their policy on um, the keeping of dogs uh, in public housing. And we think that is really wrong given that about half the Hong Kong population live in public housing, that they shouldn't be allowed to, to keep their pets when they move into that public housing. Um, and we really hope uh, that um, the housing department uh, behaves in a, in a more pet friendly manner going forward um, and supports in the new public housing that will be being built um, over the next decade in Hong Kong the need for people to be able to keep their pets and to be able to live with their pets and recognises the positive um, uh, well-being that comes from being able to, to live with other species. Thank you very much. Um, there's been a couple of questions um, about the punishment and whether that's an effective way to um, to, 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 to reduce the cases. So the impact of legal penalties as a deterrent, do you have any comments on that or um, evidence from other, other jurisdictions again? Well, we only saw uh, one repeat offender within the, the seven year study. Now that doesn't mean to say that, um, if this, of course, everyone should needs to recognize that this was the data that related to a certain category of cases that we had access to. Now, we are confident, of course, that this is a good reflection of what was going on because it's the, the period that it looked at and because it was the police uh, investigated cases. So it excluded um, cases where there was no prima facie evidence that, that of, a, of an offence having taken place. But it, it doesn't take into account cases where the SPCA was not involved, so the police may have seized animals on their own. It doesn't take into account uh, cases where AFCD was involved and, and the SPCA may not have been. It, it's only cases that involved the police and the SPCA that appeared in our database. But even then, I think um, the fact that we don't have any repeat offenders suggests something. Um, at the same time, um, I think that uh, it's important that um, we recognize that 
uh, cases will not necessarily um, be uh, noticed. Uh, the animals will not necessarily be rescued. Um, and that we are very careful about giving people who have uh, a history of treating animals badly back animals in order to enable them perhaps to do it again. Um, I think, uh, Amanda, I don't really want to touch on this, but um, it was interesting that whilst in terms of animal cruelty, you know, we may question whether the, the deterrent effect, obviously people are in animal businesses are aware of the legislation, you're educated, you're aware of the penalties, it should be a deterrent. Um, but I think that there was a change in the, the sort of commercial pet trade link cases. So they dropped significantly. So the amendment to CAT 139 with the increased fines and penalties and better system has led to a fall in those cases amongst the licensed pet trade. Um, of course, there still is an issue within the pet trade in terms of illegal underground internet smuggling pet trade. Um, but obviously the, the sort of, we haven't seen so many overt cases um, coming out just yet. Yeah, that's very true. Um, um, it used to be the case that you could call yourself a hobby breeder in Hong Kong and breed dogs and cats pretty much as you wished. Um, with the introduction in 2016 to 17 of, of the regulation requiring everybody who trades a dog to have a license, that has had a very significant effect on the number of breeding cases that have been um, identified and prosecuted. And as Fiona said, a lot of it's gone underground. A lot of it's on the internet now, unfortunately, um, and that's very difficult to police, uh, but at, at least we're seeing far less of this open puppy milling, which is what we were seeing before the amendment to the law. Thank you. And that actually links in very well with a, a question that was asked specifically about um, breeding farms and puppy mills and kitten mills. Um, what, what do you think are the additional measures that could be taken to, to stamp out that practice? And uh, I, I'm not sure whether you want to tackle this question head on, but whether the whether the retail sale of animals and pet shops um, in Hong Kong should be banned, whether, whether that's something for consideration. Fiona? Um, well, from the FPCA's point of view, we would love eventually for, for pet shops themselves to be that third party uh, sort of retail outlet type of sales be banned. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done in the pet trade. I mean, we've started to tackle the dog. Uh, pet trade, but um, the, the, it seems now that there's big issues emerging in the, the kitten milling and cat trade, um, exotic pet trade, other species as well. So, you know, the, the work with the, the dog area is just proceeding. But I think, a, you know, a big issue is that the Hong Kong public has to take some responsibility because the people who are going online on the internet through private messaging groups, um, buying dogs and on Taobao in China potentially and getting them smuggled into Hong Kong. I mean, you know, people who are participating in that legal trade are actually driving the demand and then the supply. So they're actually contributing to the whole system as well. So I think it is, you know, partly an enforcement issue and a legislation thing in terms of improving regulations, other areas of the trade. And we always say, you know, adopt, don't shop, or if you're going to go and buy an animal, go to the breeder, go to the source, check out the welfare, make sure it's a legitimate sort of uh, source of the animal. Um, and, and obviously be very careful. We're seeing a, a very large amount of, of animals coming in with, with diseases that historically we used to see a long time ago. Um, and, and we suspect that these may be coming from China. So bringing in things like parvovirus, distemper, feline infectious enteritis virus, things like that. So it's a big concern. concern. Thank you very much. And, and, and on that point of uh, problems with um, uh, animal abuse that are associated with profit making, uh, one of the questions is asking, are you seeing any trends in that, in these profit making activities um, that uh, result in, in, in animal abuse? Um, I think uh, if we look at sort of areas of animal abuse, you might, you might call it misuse to some extent. Um, you know, we have a lot of uh, businesses opening up. We have a lot of, you know, farms that have animals as part of their attractions. We have pet cafes. We have all sort of animal businesses, new businesses that are coming out that are, that are not regulated and are vulnerable, have animals in vulnerable situations where they may be misused or neglected. 
Um, and obviously, one area that we talk about is animal sheltering, because, you know, these are large scale operations quite often run as, as, you know, registered charities, etc. And so we believe that there should equally be some oversight and minimum standards and safeguards for those animals in those types of situations as well. Um, you know, and we're not just talking about cat and dog shelters, we've got all sorts of species being sheltered and, and collected. So we just need to be aware that, that we need to look at what these, these places are. And again, whether or not the existence, existing system is suitable moving forward. Do we give the animals in, in places that are covered by exhibition licenses enough, enough safeguards? Do we need to look at that whole system and, and have a whole set of regulations? Because currently in terms of farming, it's only farming for like food production that's regulated. So dairy farming, you know, um, sort of things like that. So again, we've got other places that are keeping large numbers of animals that may not be having those safeguards and minimum standards that you would even see on a farm. And even those probably need improving as well. Very much. Um, I think you might have, there's a question here about the animal abuse cases that, that uh, failed to go to trial because of the lack of evidence and whether there are any measures um, that the government can take to hold those people accountable. I wonder if this comes back a, a little bit to your point, Fiona, about, um, about it being a requirement to, to report if you're, if you're aware of it being an offence not to, and perhaps there are some other, um, some other ways as well. So I hand that over to you both. Yeah, Fiona is absolutely right. I mean, people need to be proactive about reporting what they see. They need to, once they've made a report, um, make themselves available to give evidence at court. Um, you can't, you can't uh, prosecute a case without evidence. So um, it's, not, it's not possible for the case to be taken forward unless there is sufficient evidence to have a, a reasonable chance to, to uh, convict um, that person beyond all reasonable doubt. That is the criminal standard and animal cruelty is a crime. So this is the, this is the game. I mean, it has to be done properly. So people do need to uh, provide the evidence um, where they can to enforcement authorities. Um, what we'd like to see, of course, is that uh, animal cruelty is redefined as an indictable crime, um, which means that there would be no statute of limitation on how long you would have to bring that charge to court. Um, that would make a difference as far as gathering evidence is concerned, because you would have a longer period um, to gather the evidence. But uh, in animal cruelty cases, of course, um, witness statements are key. Uh, so it's important that, that people who are aware of animal cruelty report it um, and, and give evidence where they can. Uh, Julia, you're mute. <laughs> Thank you. That was a bit of Friday afternoon outside yep. my office, so I just <laughs> muted. Um, so somebody has asked if the... Um, if the PowerPoint uh, slides might be made available to the participants? I believe that, this, uh, that the recording will be made available of this afterwards for people to look at, yes. Right, uh, and there's, there's, there's one last question, which perhaps this is a good one to end on. Um, so it, it's about the, whether there might be exceptions, and I, I know you've touched on this, but I, I, I'm sure it's something you wouldn't uh, mind reiterating, whether there should be exceptions for those who are hoarding um, volunteers, foster carers who are unlicensed to pick up street cats, they put them up for adoption by Facebook and, uh, and that those self-motivated volunteers um, who are helping with animal welfare, should they be protected for the hoarding offences? People who are, who are providing animals with animal welfare, of course, um, don't have anything to be concerned about. What concerns me though is that, and maybe it was a mistyping, but the idea that hoarding is ever about positive animal welfare. Hoarding is about negative animal welfare. If people are keeping ways in animals that are negative, then the law um, should apply to them just as it applies to everybody else. Um, I think the key thing is, is, you know, when you take an animal under control, you have that responsibility to ensure their good welfare. So you are then responsible for any sort of consequence of your actions. Um, so you can't give somebody an exemption against being prosecuted for animal cruelty because they're doing it with good intention. 
Um, obviously, the idea is not to have a negative impact on the sheltering system, but it's to safeguard them by saying you're licensed, you're regulated, you've been inspected, you know, but should they breach the minimum standards or should they breach the legislation, then they are equally going to be acceptable for prosecution as well. I mean, there's also been, you know, people saying, oh, we're, you know, potentially um, in the food uh, industry with live animals, we should be exempted. But of course, you know, that that's against the principle that if you do something that breaches the standard of cruelty, which is causing unnecessary suffering, then you are liable to prosecution. Um, and obviously, you know, it, at the moment with um, with the trading with the trading regulations, then some of these people do have exemptions from prosecution under trading. But then we don't want them to have an exemption from cruelty if they do something egregious, like have three hundred cats and not feed them and not take them to the vet and neglect them, that they're all sick and suffering and emaciated and in horrible environment. Um, so again, that that exemption would not be there for them. But obviously, the yeah, the idea is not to penalise them for doing their good work as long as it's done within that, that framework of a positive welfare environment. Thank you very much. We don't have any further questions. Um, it's my great pleasure to thank you both and, and your whole team for this uh, really important landmark study and bringing it to the attention of the public. Um, thank you on behalf of people and animals because it's such important work and I know um, that it's going to be the basis for, for, for so much um, improvement in animal welfare and of course raising new questions that we need to, to answer as well. So thank you very much uh, to both of you, Amanda Whitford and Fiona Woodhouse, um, and thank you to everybody for coming um, and for interacting with, with your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Bye-bye.